peace is at the very heart of human development. Peace I bring you, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. That statement attributed to Jesus Christ is not only known to him. I can refer to many religions, both within and without Africa, that talk about peace. Peacemakers and peacemaking are, is critical because we recognize that without peace, without tranquility, you cannot realize your potential. And, and African communities, like other communities, have always had means of mediating conflict. Because conflict is part and parcel of human engagement, part and parcel of society. And it is therefore important to reiterate that peacemaking is an exercise that must never be poo-pooed, it must never be abandoned. Of course, peacemaking is not always successful, but history has also taught us that all conflicts throughout the ages always end with peace. So you choose either to engage in war and suffer the pain, then make peace, or make peace in order to avoid war. The choice is ours. Let us ask ourselves how the UN came about, because that is important. After the European tribal wars, which were you know, normally referred to as the World War, the first European tribal wars, which was 1914 to 1918, we created the League of Nations. And the whole idea was to create a multinational body which would ensure that there would be no war of that magnitude, of the magnitude that was seen in Europe between 1914 and 1918. But as you and me know, there was another war from 1939 to 1945. Another war came and the international community as then constituted took the view that the World War II or the European Tribal War, the second European Tribal Wars, was the war that would end all wars. That is how they sat down in 1945 in San Francisco in the United States of America and came up with the UN, complete with what I call chapters, chapter seven that deals with peace and security. Three years later in Paris in 1948, there was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And this is the period when you begin to see the decolonization culminating in the independence of India in 1947, 48. And in 1949, the international community once again sat down in Geneva to come up with the four Geneva conventions dealing with war. So you can see that the UN, the motivation behind the creation of the UN was to ensure that there is a body that can work towards ensuring that there is sustainable peace and also to ensure that if there is conflict, there would be an international intervention which would uh, enforce peace or create peace. The truth and the reality is that has not always happened. Because no sooner had the World War ended than we saw the Korean Wars, the Korean Wars in 1953. And a series of other conflicts that then took place, we see the, after India regains independence, we see the breakaway with Pakistan in 1971, we see the breakaway with the uh, with the Bangladesh, we see what happens in Indonesia with the East Timor and in Africa, we see what happened in Congo in 1961 after the assassination of Patrice Emery Lumumba and the UN is invited. We see the invitation of the UN after the civil war in uh, the civil war in Nigeria. We see the entry of the UN in different settings. And there are cases where the UN peace missions have contributed positively 
But there are cases where they have not contributed as they ought to have, and they have been accused. In the Rwanda situation during the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis, the UN missions were there. We have seen the UN missions in Congo being accused of smuggling. We have seen the UN mission in Burkina Faso. And right now, we have seen the Mali government say that they do not want the UN peacekeeping forces. So it has been a mixed kind of situation with the UN forces. Remember that the UN does not have a standing force of its own. It is the members that contribute the forces for purposes of peace in Somalia, in different places. So there is a case to say that you need a multinational force and uh, operating under the aegis of the United Nations or under the aegis of the African Union for purposes of ensuring that there is a neutrality in the enforcement of peace. But as I've already indicated, it is not always the case that they fulfill their mandate without causing trouble or without one side or the other being dissatisfied with the manner of the execution of that mandate. If you look at the situation in Mali, for example, the reason why the UN was asked to go into Mali is because of the insurgency against the Bamako government. And it is true that the insurgency, which is uh, an insurgency informed by bodies such as Al-Qaeda Al and uh, uh, the Sahelian Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram, the idea was to seize Mali and convert it into an Islamic state. The same thing you see in Central African Republic where they have such a situation, the same thing in, uh, in Burkina Faso, the same thing in Chad and, and, and Niger. So that in the Sahelian region, what has happened is that terrorist groups claiming to act under the force of religion saying that we do not want Western education. In fact, what Boko Haram means simply that the book is illegitimate, book, the book is Haram, and therefore they want to institute a caliphate in those areas. And this is what is called the unrolling of the carpet, what is the Islamization, and we seldom say the Arabization of the entire part of Africa. And when they get into that space, they overwhelm armies. And therefore, when peace is negotiated, you need a body that is going to mediate. Hence, what I've said, as I've said in Mali and Burkina Faso, Central African Republic and such situations. In Sudan, as we know it today, of course, we did not have a, a force even after, but there was a, some kind of UN presence in the Darfur region. And once again, the mandate is what defined what they, how they behave and what kind of force they use. If it is a peacekeeping force, then the amount of deadly force that they can use is only to defend themselves. If they are brought in for purposes of enforcing force, of en enforcing peace, then the amount of, uh, of violence that they can use or force that they can use is also determined. So the mandate of these forces are always very clearly spelled out. And, and we've seen them fail monumentally and dramatically. If you look at the situation in Eastern Congo where they have been there for over 10 years, MUNISCO, I think, and, and, and they are not doing very well because they are individual, they get integrated into the conflicts there, they become part of the smuggling rings, and they are no longer useful either to the country that called them or the mandate that they were called to enforce disappeared. And if you look historically, 1961, when there was an uprising against the Lumumba government instigated, as we now know, by the Belgians and the Americans, Lumumba did call the UN force. And in fact, the then Secretary General of the UN, Doug Hammarskjöld, perished when he was on his way to Congo. He himself was uh, very traumatized by the activities in that area. So the UN is a body that we now know needs reform in order to revise its mandate and efficacy of the institutions which operate under its authority. It depends. There have been circumstances where 
African countries have resolved their problems. And it's not only African. We remember that at one time, uh, there were major problems in Latin America, in Nicaragua, in Colombia, in Brazil, in Argentina. So it is not true that uh, these problems only happen in Africa. In Asia, we remember the problems, as we know, as I've already indicated, in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, in uh, Vietnam, in Colombia, rather in, 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 in uh, places such as Cambodia and Laos. They have been there. In Asia, we have seen the problems of Korea. But within the continent of Africa, we have had conflicts which have been resolved internally. When there were problems in Sierra Leone and in Liberia, it is the ECOMOG force which was created under the auspices of ECOWAS and led by Nigeria that resolved the problem. So ECOMOG was there. We did not ask the UN to come in. So that was the situation. Much more recently, in the same region, when the president of Liberia, or the president of the Gambia did not want to leave office here at Germany, once again, it is ECOMOG that resolved that particular problem. We also know that when there was a conflict in the Congo uh, several years ago, it is SADAC which was involved in that particular uh, conflict resolution. And we also saw that we have had forces in Southern Sudan which also resolved the problem. So there have been cases when African countries working in unison have resolved their problems and it is only when they cannot do it because of finances that they have invited uh, the United Nations. And even when they invite the United Nations, you know that is African forces that are involved. For example, in Somalia, it is the Burundi forces that are involved, it's the Ugandan forces that are involved, it's the Kenyan forces that are involved. It's not as if you have forces from outside who are involved. They may provide financial and logistical support, but the forces are uniquely African. You must know that <laughs> Conflict is a multi-billion dollar industry. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. In Eastern Congo, there are estimates which now tell us that there could be over 120 organized armed groups. And when they are organized in that way, they are involved in illicit minings. They are involved in activities which interest gun runners. There is no factory for making guns in the Congo. There is no factory for making bullets in the Congo. So there are people from different parts of the world who want that situation because in a war situation, you need medicine. You need food, you need water. So the truth is there are many hidden hands which are involved in perpetuating this conflict situation. Even the UN itself finds itself helpless in the face of this situation. How is it that conflicts cannot end in Libya? How is it that conflicts cannot end in Syria? How is it that conflicts cannot end in the Democratic Republic of Congo? How is it that we have conflicts in the Sahelian region? They are hidden hands, sometimes manipulating and working with local hands. So it is true, there is interference. Because Africa sometimes is a political chessboard and a theater for domination by other world powers. We can learn from those missions that when you listen to governments and when you involve the people and you are sensitive to the realities on the ground, then you will be successful. Because sustainable peace not only requires but demands that you understand the population in which you are operating. And if you go into an arena and you are neutral and non-aligned, then there will be success. But if you want to play politics, as we saw with the UN mission in, uh, in Rwanda, then you will fail. But if you know that your mandate is that of preserving peace or enforcing peace, then you will always succeed. There is only one lesson to be learned. Fulfill your mandate. Don't be swayed by temporal politics or partisan politics. I am of the view, and I may be wrong, that if 
the Russian-Ukrainian conflict were to be left to the Russians and Ukrainians, it would not have taken more than two months. I believe they would have negotiated and I believe that the war would have ended somehow. But immediately NATO came into the arena. Immediately the war machine and war industry in Europe and America entered into the arena and are supplying, supplying uh, war equipment, uh, aircraft, uh, missiles, and bullets. Then it became an industry. And I would want to see the profits that have been made by the companies that manufacture arms in Europe and America after this war, I think their profits must have jumped by several percentage points. Just the supply of equipment and other logistical support is in the millions. Because all these monies and all these things that are being supplied to Ukraine, they'll pay for them. When the time for reparation comes, when there is something in the equivalent of a Marshall Plan to rebuild Ukraine, people are going to make money in the billions. And remember that Ukraine is now a theater of war for Western um, war arms manufacturing companies to also test their equipment. They are testing. Now they are taking the cluster bomb, which have not been used in war for a long time. They now want to see what developments have been made and how they work in a real war situation. These are malevolent individuals who are perpetuating this war. So it is true to say that there is big business that is playing out in Ukraine. You know, the year 2021, I think, was the year of silencing the guns in Africa. It came, the guns were not silenced. And in my view, one of the things that Africa should do as Africa is to say no military basis by any foreign power in the continent of Africa. Not an American military base, not a Japanese military base, not a Russian military base, not a Chinese military base, because once you allow those bases to come into your neighborhood, you now become participants in any conflict that arises between or amongst those powers. You go to Djibouti and you see what is happening there. It is a theater, it's, 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 it's a place where all these military bases, Japanese, everybody, the ones that I've mentioned. So in order to have peace, under the aegis of the African Union, Africans must make a resolution, no military bases. And once they agree that they have no military bases, then you have collaboration and cooperation. And they must say, no more Africans are going to be trained in West Point or Sandhurst, or going to be trained outside of the continent. We train ourselves have our military, which is informed by the African reality for purpose of defense. That is the only thing that is going to guarantee. And in order to do that, one of the things that African countries must do is to resolve the outstanding conflicts and look to the root of the, those conflicts. If you go to Ethiopia, we must ask ourselves why the Tigray are dissatisfied, why the Oromo are not happy, why the Amhara are not happy, why the Somalis are not happy. When we go to Cameroon, we've got to ask ourselves why the Ambazonians are not happy. When we go to Central Africa, the same. When we go to Congo, the same. When we go to Mali, when we go to Namibia, the same. When we go to Zimbabwe, the same. When we go to Somalia, the same. And once in Sudan, the same. South Sudan, the same. And we come to the table and resolve those conflicts. And once we resolve them, then we go into the second phase of ensuring that as and when conflicts emerge, we very quickly move in to mediate them. One of the things that we must not do in the face of the many conflicts is to play the ostrich by burying our heads into the sand and believe and behave as if those conflicts will resolve themselves. They must be resolved by us and as long as they are not resolved by us and we allow other hands and other people to resolve them, then we'll be perennially weak. I was myself very dissatisfied recently when I saw that it is the Saudi government and the American governments in Jeddah that are talking about resolving the conflict in Sudan. At a time when we have an African Union and when I see that the eager proposal for peace is being rejected, in my view, it is very unfortunate 
And we ought to ask ourselves very quickly what it is that we can do for purposes of ensuring that we are participating in resolving this conflict within the continent of Africa by ourselves, and we can. You know, <laughs> the European NGOs and the American NGOs are part of the problem. Some of them thrive on, in conflict situations, so they don't want war to end. What will happen if war ends? And some of them are also used as spy agencies. They get into communities and they disempower communities. This idea that you have somebody who tells you that they are going to feed you and supply you with the energy biscuits and to supply with water and, and, and all these other things for the rest of your life is disempowering. Some of these organizations were created for purposes of dealing in emergency situation. And what is emergency has now become permanent. One of the things that we must do is to begin to have these organizations disengage. That is not to say that some of them have not done a good job. There are some which, in my view, over the years have done a good job. But they must have an exit plan. They must have a plan which ensures that during the period that they are in different countries in the continent of Africa, they empower local agencies. But they do not do that. What they do is that they come into the communities and they drive all these four wheels. As a friend of mine once said, that in certain parts of Africa, you find NGO V8 cars, and if they are fighting malaria, the cars are more than the mosquitoes. Of course, that was said in jest, but it is a statement of how then uh, poverty becomes an industry and conflict becomes an industry. And once it becomes an industry, people don't want the industry to end. It is our duty to say exit plan. The Eritreans have dealt with such NGOs a little bit firmly, some would say a little bit unreasonably, but there is something to borrow from the Eritreans on how to deal with these bodies so that they don't become a permanent fixture in our affairs. My thoughts are that there is no one size fits all. I believe that every country, as informed by the realities in the country, must deal with these bodies in the manner that is in the best interest of those countries. That is my reaction number one. My reaction number two, which is much more overarching, is that we should not allow our domestic problems to be resolved by outsiders. Really, the fact that you have external bodies, bodies that are created by other governments or by people in other countries, resolving your domestic problems is in itself something that is undesirable. And it ought to happen only as a way of dealing with an emergency situation. is as if your house is on fire. You don't need the firefighters to be a resident in your room, to occupy a room in your house. Once they have put off the fire, let them go back to the fire station. But we have firefighters who now say they want a bedroom in your house because they fear that fire can arise at any time. I don't think that that is the way to deal with it. We've got to resolve it differently. And the sooner we do, the better. Africa can do better, should have done better, but continues to punch below our weight. And when I look at our circumstances, the truth is we have been our own best helpers. All these things you see in terms of aid and other things, if you look at them keenly, they don't contribute more than 30% to the things that drive Africa. If, and Africa is largely rural. And in rural Africa, the women particularly are involved in production and feeding their families. They have no connection to the banks. They have no connection to foreign powers. The truth is 70% in our own way, we are supporting our affairs. But the other parts of the world, particularly Europeans and Americans, if they give you $1, you think they've given you $1 million. They shout about it. They give you a bag of maize which bears their name. It is like giving somebody a gift of a shirt and they write in the breast pocket of the shirt, this shirt was donated to you, surely. These givers who humiliate the receivers, they are not the ones that we want. My answer is, we are solving more than 70% of our problems. Those who help us, 30%, make so much noise that you'd think that if it were not for them, we would be dead, dead, dead and gone. 
That is not the truth. You know, you never know the instructions that the personnel in these NGOs have. And I want to believe, and I may be wrong, that many of these NGOs are also conduits for agencies, spy agencies from their country, and that they report directly on a daily basis. Sometimes they may not even know, but when they file their reports about situations in the countries in which they are resident, that is used as raw material for intelligence. That is why they are funded. That is why they are enabled. That is why people contribute to them and they are tax exempt. So they are not innocent. These are Trojan horses, some of them, and they are used quite effectively. Every country does regulate. In Kenya, you'll find there is the NGO Bureau, and in many other countries, they are regulated. But the regulation that is in many African countries is very weak because we need the money, and well, we think we need the money. We, we just slap them on the wrist. They come and they settle, and they have status. Some of them even enjoy diplomatic status. That is how powerful they are, because the countries from which they come are powerful. The countries from which they come are so-called donors or development partners or whatever you want to call them, as they keep on changing their names. But really, they may change the name, but the intention and the agenda remains one, to control, to disempower, under the guise of supporting and helping. How do you close your factory? <laughs> Kibera is a factory for NGOs, so on a single item, and I say this from a point of knowledge, on a single item like the provision of clean water and sanitation, there are hundreds of NGOs that have been active in Kibera for the last 20 years. And yet when you go to Kibera, you still see water, which is not portable, being carried in jerry cans. Why? Because they don't want to solve the problem. They don't want to solve the problem because if you solve the problem, then you lose a job. That is how you must see these. And we must have time and a timetable for them. I think President Paul Kagame of Rwanda does it very well. He, he actually wants to know what you are doing and when you are leaving because you ought not to be permanent in that area. But we have been lulled into a false sense of security by these NGOs. They come and say, we are giving you water, we sink this borehole, we have this school feeding program, and they keep on feeding you, and they tell you not to feed yourself, so you forget how to seek food, you rely on donor aid, and uh, you remain a child for life. You remain a beggar for life. You remain an object of pity for life. You remain a person whose esteem has been destroyed for life. You remain fodder for life. You are dehumanized for life. You are humiliated for life. Sad. Governments. African governments must play their role. We have played the blame game for too long. We must also say that the reason why those NGOs are in our countries is because our governments have failed. Governments are instituted amongst men and in countries for purposes of using taxes to resolve those problems. But what do we have in many African governments? Thieves, who when they are made to preside over health services, they steal the money. When they are made to preside over road, they steal the money. When they are made to preside over school, they steal the money. If you look at some of the richest men and women in Africa, they are to be found in government. The poorly paid civil servants in Africa are paradoxically the richest. And what do they do? The money that is meant for water, the money that is meant for health, for education, they steal it and build hotels. Hotels have now become their favorite. And if they don't build hotels, they are building apartments. And if they don't build apartments, they are keeping the money in Panama. And now they are beginning to keep it in Mauritius and the Caymans Islands and Gansi Island. Governments in Africa are underperforming. And therefore, these NGOs are filling that void. 
And we must, as a people, make demands of our government. Our threshold of satisfaction as a people in Africa is very low. We don't make demands of those whom we elect into government, and they have great contempt for us. And that is the problem. If African governments were to do things properly, you would not need NGOs. And there are countries where they are doing things properly. If you go to Mauritius, things are being done properly. If you go to Seychelles, things are being done properly. If you go to Botswana, things are being done properly. You go to Rwanda, things are being done properly. If you go to Tanzania, they are beginning to do things properly. If you go to Uganda, certain things are being done properly. When I was growing up in Nairobi, things were being done properly. Garbage was collected three times a day. There were hot lunch in Nairobi. There was free education free indeed with excise books and textbooks being supplied. There was medicine in our dispensaries and in all other places. Then we lost the script, then we dropped the baton and we started electing a bunch of thieves into public office and we have never recovered because we ran kleptocracies masquerading as democracies. We are part of the problem, we the people. Democracy require, requires that the people themselves are eternally vigilant. It is we who elect those individuals. If you allow yourselves to be persuaded by individuals to elect them because of your ethnic affiliation or because they have corrupted you, then you are making the mistake. If you go to countries where people make demands of their leaders, things are being delivered. You go to the Scandinavian country, you go to Norway, you go to Denmark, you go to Finland, you go to Sweden and see how things are working. Because if you joke, the people will come and make you resign. But here, a person steals and we say we know he's a thief, but he's our thief. How can a country grow? A friend of mine once told me, that when you blame the windmill, you must also blame the wind. The leaders are the windmill, we are the wind. If we choose to swim in the sea of ignorance, then we can only discover islands of corruption. But if we choose to swim in the seas of meritocracy, then we can discover islands of hope. The choice is ours. For the moment we have chosen to drink from the poison chalice of ethnicity and corruption, and we are reaping the dividends, bitter fruits.